Welcome to Puzzling Company, your home for at-home puzzles and mysteries. Here are your hosts, Jared and Zach. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Puzzling Company. It is your host, Zach, and always with me is... Jared. Is it Jared? I think it's me. Okay, well... This is an existential crisis in the making. Oh no, who am I? <laughs> That's the real questions we have to ask now. That's, and maybe the puzzles reveal who we really are, Zach. That is true. Well, welcome back, guys. Uh, this is going to be a great episode. We're going to be discussing escape mail Ooh. all the way from the great up north. Great white north. It's up north, okay? How <laughs> dare you? It is the great white north, but maybe they're just up from us, okay? But what if you're like in uh, like Iceland, Greenland, the North Pole? Santa can't say that. Okay, that's fair. This could be. I'm, a, I'm this, sorry, Icelandic viewers. I didn't. I didn't mean to. Uh, this mean, could be a loaded episode. Now we're just starting off fighting with each other. Yeah, <laughs> this is going to be a fun episode. Uh, stick around. Jared, 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 Jared. I found this really cool box outside. Can we please, please, please? Can we open it? Are you out of your mind? Look what it says on the box. It literally reads "Root of All Evil." There's no way we're opening this box. Oh, come on, Jared. What's the worst that can happen? What's the worst? That... Have you ever seen a horror movie? Listen, you don't split up your team. The basement is not a good hiding place. You don't give cute little creatures water. And above all, you don't open the mysterious and creepy box with the word evil on it. Please, Jared. No. But if you're listening and you have more guts than me, you should actually head over to crackinutmysteries.com and pick up a copy of Root of All Evil. Um, Jared, I think I need to tell you something. Gee Willikers, man, that's such a great ad. I, I, Jared, I don't know if you can get tired of our ads, but I love hearing myself all the time. I think it's time we make some more. Really? I mean, those are great. I don't know if I can do better than that, to be honest. I mean, but we've got to push ourselves. Like, we could hit a little bit of a slump, but I think it's time. I think I, w I don't want to get rid of the old ads, but I want to add some new ones. I think I think that's a good idea. I think the only part, though, is those are like my Mona Lisas. Do you just, like, do a better Mona Lisa? I don't think so. So Well, it's hard. It's like most movies. You know, the first one's, like, epic, and yep. then you kind of slump. But there's some movies where, like, the third the one's... The sequel's really, good. Yeah. Agreed. I think I can make only pure art, so I, I think we'll be fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, welcome back. Uh, so this is going to be opening up into our first segment. In this segment, we're going to be talking about our likes and kind of things for rooms for improvement for the game that we'd be discussing. And like we said in the opener, the game that we'll, we will be discussing is Escape Mail. Oh, yeah. Uh, so let's get it started, actually. So, Jared, what's something that we liked about Escape Mail? Well, let me talk a little bit about Escape Mail first. For those of you who don't know what it is, it's a monthly mailing envelope, and it does follow a single storyline. So they're currently, and you'll hear this later on, beta testing their 11th of 12 in this first storyline. We played the first three, uh, just to give some context for what we're reviewing today. Uh, and it was uh, it was something that kind of took us by surprise a little bit. Mm. Um, one of the things that I just absolutely adore about this game is something called the flow card. And I have not seen this in any other game. And I am such a huge fan of it. Uh, I, it will it is posted up on our wall. And what it is, is it's just a it, it, it's a business card size piece of paper that is guiding you through your adventure. Because in so many of the games that we receive episodically, you have a bunch of things that come out of a small box or an envelope and maybe a starting point. But what this does is it has a picture of every single thing that you receive in an envelope. And it's like a flow chart it says, hey, I'm not gonna give you the answers to all of these things, but you're gonna start here. You're gonna work on this next. And I love that. I love that. I love that. I love it because it is the ultimate signposting and it works really well from a customer standpoint, but now it puts the impetus on the creator to say like, okay, I know what's coming. You better wow me. 
Like, this better be good now that you've taken away that element of the unknown in terms of what we're tackling mm-hmm. from puzzle to puzzle. But I loved it. I thought it was so smart, and I can't talk enough about it. I, In talking to one of the owners, Eric, I even was a little gushy in how much I just loved that, the idea of that. Mm-hmm. Because it just, it, it eliminates so many things going wrong. Agreed. Very much agreed. It's nice when it's it's purely laid out for you. Yes. And it doesn't, it didn't take away the experience. Like it amplified the experience. And it, and on, do I think it helped us move things through things quicker? Yes. I do think it made the game shorter, but I think it made the game more enjoyable because we didn't have to wonder like, is this what we're working on now? Is that what I'm supposed to be? It left very little room for questioning the game. Mm-hmm. And I, I think to go on with that, I think one of the things that we really enjoyed was the ranging difficulties that is provided through this experience. Yes. So when you get these games, they give you, I think in the third episode specifically is when they start giving you options. Um, so in the first two, there's just our regular difficulty. Uh, it's not crazy difficult, right? No. Uh, which I think is one of the best compliments we can give to this game is me and Jared were talking about this one day that this might actually be a game that I would recommend to someone joining the space easily 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 it is not difficult i mean there are hard puzzles but i mean like it's not like the most difficult game you've ever played they give they lay it out for you in the flow card and it's just presentable like i could give it to anyone and my mom that never plays an escape room or any of that stuff could easily play it right yes um it's just so nice and then the range of difficulties part gives it a part of the game where there's more if you want more and even easier if you just like hey you're literally going to give this to, you know, a few kids, maybe some like young teenagers that are like wanting to like learn how to play these types of things and you want to do it or for like a school activity. Yes. You can give them to them and it it's simple. Um, the website that comes with it, that has like the hint system and everything like that it presents it very well to help you kind of figure out where you might be getting stuck. It just, I mean, and in the hard difficulty. Um, so in episode three is the first time that we got the difference between easy and difficult right and Um, i believe we had the difficult correct we had the regular slash hard difficulty when i went to their website i had realized they did have an easier version of this game which i looked at the difference between the two and basically it takes out one of the elements that makes you work harder to figure out some of the parts of the game yes yes um just because you have to figure out a system that is in play to help you solve the whole game and it's to be honest for us it wasn't the most crazy thing ever Um, But it was a nice added element that makes us work harder to achieve the goal. But like when you look at the base version, I was like, okay, so someone who literally like you can just drop the hardest part of the game and it it becomes fun. I was one thing I will say that I kind of liked about episode three, two uh, is it was a little bit different than the first two in terms of what you could do with it. Episode three, episode three introduces a whole new mechanic that you get to build the set and the the space you're playing in. That's kind of fun. Um, but yeah, I, I think the range and difficulty in this game was phenomenally done. The reason that this is so important to Zach and I is because Zach and I kind of have two different parts of the same heart. One of these is we are enthusiasts when it comes to this stuff. So we love to see t- stuff from time to time that is an increased level of difficulty, maybe a game that's going to take six to 12 hours of our time. And it is a total nerd fest for us to dive into the deep end of the puzzling pool. But something that's also true about us and where we see this industry going is the other half of that is we want to bring as many people as possible into this. So when we run into a game that, I mean, we probably blew through these three envelopes in an hour and 15 minutes, hour and 20 minutes. Yeah. Like we, this was not difficult for us and that's not supposed to be a humble brag it's actually supposed to be a really important uh like applause for escape mail is we are always looking for games to help people bring into our world Mm -hmm. we want the community to grow we want to see more people in this space because inevitably that means our creators are going to get to make more and different things so when i run into something like escape mail from like the first half of my heart from the enthusiast i'm like Oh, that wasn't like the most exciting thing in the world. But from like a introduced people in here, I'm like, that is fantastic. I want to see more stuff like this because this is the type of game. Exactly. Like you said, I want to hand somebody. I would very easily give this to the first time player 
and I think they would love it. And then I can give them the next thing, the more interesting thing. And then they're all sitting around with the rest of us involved in a community that we're watching grow before our eyes. And I think that's why it's so important. And then to go off what you were saying about game three, and that was the third thing that we really loved is I was super impressed with the level of creativity that they gave us every envelope. It's not different in the way that like a scarlet envelope is like the game type is different. It's the same game type. It, it feels escape roomy every single time, mm -hmm. but they're giving us different looks. They're giving us different ways to manipulate things that fall in a very, you know, regular eight and a half by 11 envelope. And I, I applaud that creativity. And again, I think that's something that a new player will want to see. And I really, really enjoyed this. Um, and again, kind of took me by surprise, but I'm, I'm on the escape mail. I'm a fanboy. And I'm to, in. Yeah. And I mean, so the other part saying that they are a little different, like you said, the overarching narrative is the same, Yes, but I do like that the theme of each one changes based on location. Wild, widely. Widely. Yeah. So like, I think the first one, if I remember correctly, is more kind of like a, there's like a pirate map theme, but it's, it's mainly trying to prove yourself and kind of showing that like you want to be a part of the big picture Yes. Uh, to your, I think you're the cousin of the, the main character in the story. Um, and then the second one, you're on a, you help, you're trying to help out the cousin or you're trying to help out your cousin who's right. on the submarine. Submarine theme, love it. And the third one is a, is an ancient temple uh, trying to find treasure and stuff like that. It's, it felt crazy. Everyone going like, oh, where are we going to go next? And I'm kind of intrigued to see where the other ones do go. Yeah, I, I love it. Like it's, it's one of those things. Again, we've talked about this with other things that I probably wouldn't want to play a bunch in one day, but if this showed up at my door monthly, I would love to keep playing it, you mm -hmm. know, a uh, big fan. Um, but like all games, it's not perfect. Uh, and I want to move towards talking about some of the things that we felt like there was uh, room for improvement. And a couple of these, you'll notice they're not like directed at the game, but directed at understanding who might really like this game and who might not like this game. So Zach, why don't you kick us off? What was our first thing uh, with escape mail that we felt like there was a little room for improvement? Sure. So I think one of the first things that I would want to discuss is setup as well as like the kind of process puzzles or like the puzzles that kind of are similar throughout all the experiences. So what I mean by that is let's go over the first thing I would say is the setup in specifically game three is when you start getting a setup where you have to build a set of the game. You're, you're building the temple. You have to build out some totems for the game it takes around, I think what they were saying on their website, it takes like 30 minutes average, 20 to 30 minutes for one player to do it. It takes like 10 to 15 for us to do it. It requires cutting out things. It cut, requires tape. Uh, it, there's just a good bit of setup for the game that when we played the first two, you don't have that setup. And then the third game, it introduces setup where you're like, okay, I'm spending like 30 minutes getting the game ready. Um, it was kind of just more of a surprise to us. It wasn't like the biggest thing ever that we were like super upset, but it was just kind of a thing that like, I was like, Oh, I have to spend like 30 minutes setting up this, you know, this temple. Yes. Which turned out to be great. Like, so we liked it. It just, you know, you, you don't expect it. And you're gonna be surprised when you have to do a bunch of setup. The other part being the process puzzles and kind of the repeating ones. So in a lot of the games, the process is very similar. It is, you know, the flow chart makes it clear, but it's like solve. This gives you answer or word that goes into this, that helps you unlock this. And then this website, you need password, which you get from solving this puzzle. It kind of feels like you're doing the same thing almost over and over again to a small degree. The theme and the kind of the style of the puzzle does give it a little bit more of creativity or like a difference. So it doesn't feel like you're repeating it entirely. Right, like a little flavor. A little flavor to yeah. each. But when you realize that we did play kind of the somewhere the same game, just different places and theme over all three. You know what I mean? Like the same process. Right. My, my, my critique was more about I think more in episodes one and two we were doing long process puzzles mm -hmm. like classic puzzle here is a language you don't recognize you need to decrypt it but then we're decrypting that message for a good amount of time agreed and what I wanted to see is more content like more puzzles steps and less of the Oh, like we're working out the puzzle. And we've been talking a lot about that lately. And I know that means more effort on the creator side, but I think there is more enjoyment, not always, but standardly than giving us a little more content instead of less content and more process within those con in the content. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't as true in the third episode. Like it felt like it came Agreed. off that a little bit. 
But I agree with you. I wasn't prepared in the third episode. I think we spent more time building the game than playing the game. Yeah, I, I think I made the comment after we beat it that I think we spent like 20 minutes setting it up. And I think we I think we actually beat the game in like 10 to 15. Yeah, we flew. We, we flew, flew through we the game. We flew through that game. But it is it is like, a oh, it would have been nice to know that on the, like before I even got the envelope that this was coming my way and I could prepare my time adequately. Again, that can be subjective. That's neither here or there. Um, but I want to move into talking about maybe who this game is for and who this game isn't for. Sure. Um, because we always want our audience to pick the games that they want to play. And I personally felt like if you were an enthusiast and you are looking for something more difficult, more challenging, more of that time and money value for what you're playing, this wasn't necessarily the game for you. That doesn't mean, hey, if you're an enthusiast out there and you've played hundreds of games, don't play this. But I have seen some people in groups saying like, man, I breezed through that. I wish I would have gotten something longer. So maybe I should say, if you're looking for a longer game, this is not necessarily going to be the game for you, the pick for you. Would you agree with that? I think I agree. Yeah. Yeah. But, but on the other end of that is like, if you're a new player, this is the subscription game for you right now, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Like this is the perfect entry point into the puzzle game narrative world. I would easily hand this to you as a gift and say, hey, I want you to start playing puzzle games with me. We got a little group going. Mm -hmm. Start here and then let's go. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you say to that? Ooh, I think, I mean, I agree to everything you said. It's definitely, I think a great game for new people and not probably the thing that enthusiasts would truly enjoy. Yeah. And then the, the last thing that I think we both agree on is I think a lot of us like to know what we're getting into in terms of the materials that we're getting into. I think we would say is like, if you are not, if you are folding and cutting a verse, this is not the series for you. If that doesn't bother you, I think you'll have a wonderful time. But I know there's some people out there that are like, if I have to cut and fold and finagle and tape and do all of this, that's really frustrating to me. Stay away, <laughs> especially from episode three. Stay away. But I, I would almost argue that it's try it like it, the creativity of it outweighs the frustration of it, in my opinion. And so far out of the three games we played, at its worst, it's still not that bad. No. It, the cutting was simple. Now, like, setting up the temple was probably the most tricky part, but they, they also give you a video that shows you exactly how to do it step by step. So they give you a lot of tools and things to help you make it easier. But, yeah, I agree. I mean, if you don't like cutting, you, you're not going to like You're not going to like Like, uh, the reason I bring this up is I have some friends um, a while back. They said, hey, what, what should we play? And I said, oh, well, if you haven't tried CU Adventures, Give CU Adventures a try, mm -hmm. right? I think you'll really like that. And they came back to me and they said, we loved the game. We didn't like cutting everything out. Yep. And it's like, oh, sorry. Like that's kind of the nature of what comes with like a print and play game. Yep. Um, so that that's just a head up, heads up to anybody who has not played these that's listening. That is something you'll look out for. And if you don't want it, well, we put it out there. So disclaimer, yep. disclaimer. But that's going to, I think that's going to wrap us up. I, I mean, I, I was... I enjoyed it. Yes, I, I think this was more of a blast than we anticipated it potentially to be. Yes, didn't know what we were getting into. We breezed through it, but I think perspective is, yeah, I think I really love this because it got me excited because this is an easier game that could bring a lot of people in. It was also fun. Like, I think we just generally had a fun time yeah. with it. Like, there was no, there was nothing stressful. Like, and like I said, maybe that's part because it was, easier for us right yes but i think it was just like a fun game like i like the narrative i thought the videos that went with it that explained the narrative were fun like you know like we had a blast just like joking around like while playing it and i was like that's like a i mean there's a few games that i get stressed at you know and it you know and at the end i'm like oh that's kind of unfortunate if something but this game i was just i had a fun time, yeah, the time. it was light yeah I, I think for the enthusiasts what you would call light gaming mm -hmm. and that's I'm, I'm down for some light gaming sometimes because true i get bogged down from time to time but I think that's going to wrap us up for our first segment. Hang around for Puzzles to the People coming at you next. Solve puzzles, write reviews, win prizes. It's time for Puzzles to the People. Zach, you never responded to my email about the rally next week. The rally? Yeah, dude, they're trying to tear down the old tree off of Maine. That's a bat coon habitat. I think you mean raccoon. <laughs> Zach, next thing you know, you'll be calling swore gators alligators. Swore gators? 
bat coons? Jared, what are you talking about? Dude, everyone knows that the American Society for the Protection of Magical Creatures spends countless hours trying to preserve the habitat of these magical and magnificent creatures. Do you want your kids growing up in a world where there's no lobguins? Do I? Well, that's a fair question. Lobguins are actually very temple mirror creatures, but sometimes I can do without them. But what everyone should do is head over to theaspmc.org, that's T-H-E-A-S-P-M-C.org, and sign up to help their investigations. Only you can prevent the extinction of these magical creatures. All right, everybody, welcome back to Puzzling Company. We are now in our section of the show we call Puzzles to the People. And we do a variety of things here. Sometimes we're reading reviews, we're asking for feedback. Other times we're just having conversations that we see a lot in the groups in which we exist. And today we're going to be talking about, in my opinion, what is one of the most subjective things in the world that we exist in, and that is puzzle and experience difficulty. Okay. Okay. So I'll, I'll start our conversation with, with this is, are you in agreement with me that this is one of the most, like, do you agree with that statement? Is it one of the most wildly subjective things that we deal with game to game? I think so. I think most conversations I ever see in groups is discussing difficulty and people either saying like, it's feel like it's too difficult or it's too easy. I mean, it's something that comes up a lot because I think it's something that we all care about is completing an experience and how it felt. Yes. So difficulty is widely a, a very common factor in that. Okay, so then let's let's talk about this first question. And this this may be a little bit of a loaded question. Sure. And I want to give context. This is not how we felt about what we just played. Sure. But because I think Escape Mail has done something that is relatively unique in offering the same game with altered content in different difficulty levels, mm -hmm. we should talk about this. So my question is, does it bother you when game time and difficulty are lower than expected. So what I mean by that is a box says average game time is 60 to 90 minutes and we're rating it a three out of a five. You open the game, you beat it in 30 minutes and you're sitting here going, okay, that was a one out of five and that was kind of frustrated my experience. Sure. I think this is a hard question to answer. I think most games, do, and this is a hard part, I think difficulty rating is usually based on a large like audience of people and the average, right? And that could be test players. That could be people who are experienced, not experienced. I think the goal for a company, in my opinion, would put it as a number that is relative to the audience that you're looking for or to who you're trying to present it to. So like as an example, right, if I'm trying to get this a mass market and I'm trying to get people who maybe potentially are like trying to get new in the space in terms of playing it or even enthusiasts, I target more towards the new player. And that, cause realistically their time is the part that's going to be play, play more into it. If that makes sense to me. Yes. Um, reason why is, you know, when we do that, like in your example, if I get a game that says it's an hour and a half, like we played one today that it's expected time was an hour and a half. We beat it in like 50 minutes. Sure. Right. Uh, that's partially expected. Like if we actually play a game and we play its entire duration, it surprises me nowadays, you know, humble brag. We're so good, but no, <laughs> like it, when you play a lot of them, or that you feel like you are pretty solid at the the material at play, then like I expect to do well. So I almost expect to always do better than the time it says, unless it's a game that I go in and I go, okay, this is a game that's like going to push my limits, if that makes sense. So I, I, I don't know. I, I don't feel like it's that big of an issue to me, but if I was someone and I went into a game and I, you know, I bought it and you expected to take the full hour and a half and it only was like, 30 minutes, 45, then I could see someone being disappointed with that. Yeah, I, I agree with you. The more we play, I'm working on a different scale. I and I think a lot of our listeners are too, because what companies are trying to do is put an estimation of what the average time is. And mm -hmm. the hope is that's based on a wide group of Agreed. play testers. Like when we interviewed the wild optimist, they said, we play test, 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 we play test. Yep. It's the most time consuming part of their process. So hearing that I'm like, okay, I'm buying what you're putting on your box and your experience yep. for everybody else out there. Well, who knows? Is that five groups, 10 groups? What are you basing this? Is it, off is it of? people that all play? like, you know, sometimes I see this in, in the discussions that we have in like our Facebook groups 
is when we have play test groups, some of them are just people that we know, right. you know, so th- they're very experienced players, you know, but it doesn't mean that like, I, I don't ask to be honest, you know, sometimes I sometimes do need to ask that question is, but I feel like most good companies that I know try everyone. Cause that's the goal, right? You're trying to hit everyone in the scale. You know, it's not like unless your whole goal is to make a game that is only for enthusiasts, then maybe you play test only enthusiasts. Right. But I mean, I think most games that we've ever played, they try to get a, a wide range. Like I'd have someone that's never played a game and I'd have someone who's played every game. Sure. Like. And then the net average of that yeah. is where you would gauge a difficulty level. Uh, but yeah, it, I think earlier on it bothered me more like back way back when, when we started playing our very first games, like 2017, if it was longer or shorter, I was like, I kind of felt like, well, you guys don't know. But looking back, I'm like, well, I just didn't know. You sure. know, I was I was inexperienced, but it's hard. Um, and I want to I want to tack into that in some of these next questions. Uh, so let me ask you this. When you see a creator put a level of difficulty on a game, what is your reaction to that? Huh? I because not all games do. Correct. A lot of games, a lot of games that we play don't really actually have a difficulty that we played in like a lot of the early on games that we played. I don't think have difficulty ratings. Sure. I see a lot of it in mass market. Yeah. And so it, it, it ranges, but it seems like even in escape rooms, a lot of escape rooms will say like, this, this is, is like a, this is an eight out of 10. But like, what is, when you see that, what's your reaction to that? It's the creator trying to tell me what they, uh, after testing and what they think it's difficulty is to me, when I see that it goes, okay, is it really that difficulty? Like, because I think generally for someone who's comes from our point of view, difficulty does play into it a little bit. Like when I see a number, but it, it more is like an invitation to me go, okay, I'm going to like destroy it. And eight out of 10, no big whoop. Uh, give me a 10 out. Give me an 11 out of 10 or else I don't really care. <laughs> you know? And I'm not saying that like in any bad case toward a creator who does do that. Um, I think for us, a difficulty rating is just trying to show maybe someone who's more newer in the space. I I think a lot of these questions, honestly, you're going to probably ask are more towards the opinion of an enthusiast versus a new person, because I think a new person having a difficulty rating feels really nice. Like example, in the escape room space, one of the most common questions that I ever get when I, you know, like when I work at MER and stuff like that is, and MER is Mercer escape rooms, uh, is, uh, you know, well, what's the difficulty rating, you know, and no one that I know who really plays a lot of them asks that question. Right. But people who are new always ask that question. They're like, how many people get out? You know, and you're like, well, like the difficulty rating, you know, it, for this game probably is around like 40%, 35, 40. Right. That's the escape rate. Yeah. yeah escape rate. So you're like, okay, but it, it feels like that's more common to people who are newer because they're more worried or they feel like they really want to escape or they're just like want the challenge when people who are more experienced get into the space, I think the number matters less because mm. it's more about the experience itself. Like the difficulty now, if you play a game that advertises of the hardest diff- game ever for an enthusiast, that's when I think we would start to care in that category. But outside of that, I think the number matters less for us. I think it's more of like an invitation to new players. Like, hey, if you want to get into the, like these games, this is what you might be like showing up as. Sure. I, when I see it, I, I just wonder why it's there and what it's based on. Sure. Uh, because I do think there is some level and a better way of doing this objectively is not to just give it some arbitrary number sure. or number of stars, unless that is rated against other games Agreed. In, in within it, like Exit. Exit always has a one to five, I think it's Circle rating on the front of it. Mm -hmm. And my hope with that is that it's gauged on basing it on the difficulty level of other exit games. But what I think would be even better is if you gave me a scale and just put all of your games on it with the game itself being, okay, I can see that game number five is harder than game number six, but less difficult than game number three. Agreed. You, You know what I'm saying? Like that to me holds more meaning then this is a two out of five. This is a six out of 10. This is a, like, show me based on your other material, this is going to be harder. This is going to be easier. Yeah. I think the big point you're just trying to get at is scale, like understanding what the scale is. You right. Know? And I think that's, that's a true thing. Like when people do it in like the escape room world, right? Like 
people ask and some people are like, well, what do you rate it on? And you're like, well, for, you know, like for some places they do like, well, it's on like puzzle difficulty. It's on average escape, you know, like for some of them that like the, it's all different. And I think that's the weirder part too. Sometimes is every company has a way different scale. Like some yes. do one out of five stars. Some do, uh, you know, like one to 10. So, you know, like it feels like every time I get to one and I don't see a scale of explaining why I'm like, okay, well, why is that? Like you said, it's almost like a question of like, why? Sure. Like, why is that an eight out of 10? But the game before it that I thought was more difficult, it's like a six, out, you know, like, sure. what, why is that one that, but if there's no clear indication. And I get really skeptical when I see the ones that are like five out of five, 10 out of 10. My, my initial gut is this game is hard, not because it's good, but because you, you want a hard game. You're right. Because you have either added unnecessary things or they're just bad puzzles in here that make me worry. Uh-huh. Um, and, and, and then it's all contextualized on what other games that you've played. Like I'll give a couple examples uh, to some of the games we've played. Our second episode that we did was break in mm-hmm. and break in is a two out of four difficulty rating. I believe. I think so. Something like that. Yeah. But when we played that, we had already had a lot of games under our belt and that was a really difficult, like I felt like that was a more difficult game. Mm -hmm. for what they ask us. So now when I, I believe their next one, their alien game is a higher difficulty. So now I'm like, well, shoot, like, do I want to pick that up? Same thing with when we played, um, uh, ASPMC, Mm -hmm. we played it. And I believe the game that we played was a five or six out of 10. And I mean, if you go back and listen to that episode, we got wrecked by some of the later by, puzzles. By some of the later puzzles. The meta puzzle itself was yes. probably one of the most difficult. Errol, <laughs> Errol, listen to Errol this. got us, man. I Errol. Uh, but their next game was an 8 out of 10. Yeah. And even hearing them talking about it, they were like, yeah. And I was like, I don't know if I'm ready for that. So it's hard, like, because in the same breath, it feels like it is an invitation to the person picking up that game to know what they're getting into. Mm-hmm. But on some level, I think it can also be a complete turnoff. Agreed. And it, I just think uh, it's 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 hard. I think I think the difficulty rating is really hard. But I will say, in terms of escape mail, they did a really good job of saying like, we've got two tracks. Here's the two different tracks. This is going to be harder. This is going to be easier. And this is the difference like mm. explaining it out. So I I don't think it's unnecessary, but that leads me into our next question, which is should we eliminate difficulty ratings from the industry? Would that, would that do us a, a service just to have games with no understanding of what you're getting into? Okay. I'm going to answer this in two different ways. Okay. Cause I've done that with every question as an enthusiast. I think you should either get rid of the system or implement a universal system, which is actually impossible to do. Sure. But some way to rate it towards all the other games that we play. But I think that's literally impossible to rate against an experience that is like, you know, Society of Curiosities games versus playing like Scarred Envelope. Now they're somewhat similar, but they're different games. Right. How are like, you? How gonna... do you how do you rate those two games against each other? Or sure. like playing like box one versus one of those. You know, they're like two different mediums. You know, it, it feels like you can't, it's hard to do that. But in my opinion, like in those types of games, I really don't care what the like, I don't need to know what the difficulty rating is. Sure. So as an enthusiast, I would say, yeah, I think getting rid of them or finding a more universal way of making a rating system would be interesting. Now, as as someone who wants to introduce more people into the into the the space itself, I think difficulty ratings matter a lot because, like you said, it is an invitation. And a lot of people are scared when they get invited into something that it's going to be too difficult or too easy or insulted. Yeah. When you hand them one that's like, hey, this is the one out of five star game. This is a good starting place to you. And they're like, is that what you value my intelligence at? People's intelligence in escape rooms and in puzzle like spaces, people don't like being uh, judged on their yes. what they think their intellectual level is. Yes. I mean, don't get me wrong. There are times that we do really great in my intellectual level. My ego goes up exponentially. And there's times I get dumpstered and I go, OK, now I feel like I, I suck. You yes. know. But yeah, I think, uh, I think they should stay. I think the hard part is it's just not a win-win for everyone. You you kind of, I think it's a, it's one of those things, just like most things in life, there's no like real win to the situation. It's kind of like a, there's going to be positives for a certain crowd and negatives for the other. I agree. I, I, and I think if I had to pick it, like I said earlier, what I would prefer is if you have 
a lot of copies of your game out there. I want to see if you're using a, a scale one to five, one to 10, whatever, that you just make note of it somewhere that your game's difficulty are based in relation to each other. Mm -hmm. My ideal is a spectrum where you show me all of your games just in relation to each other, void of any type of, of quantification. Sure. Right. And just let the games speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. But, um, but yeah, I agree. It's almost this double edged sword of, I don't think it's a necessity, but it could be helpful, but it could hurt you. And then you have people frustrated about it. And then the thing is, I never hear anybody say in a review, thanks for telling me where this was in the level of difficulty. I agree. Like, it seems like it only hurts people on the back end, but that's because I feel like the people who are satisfied with it don't realize that that helped them pick the correct game. Correct. I think it, yeah, the people who are community, like that talk about their opinion are mostly negative because it's usually a thing that the they didn't expect it to be easier or harder than they expected. Yes. When you have fun with it and it fits your difficulty or whatever, like you said, it helped you make that decision to play it, but then no one communicates like, yeah, I like this game because of its difficulty. Yeah. Well, you know, like it, it, that is interesting to think about to say the least. No one, I haven't seen the review that was like, this said it was a four out of five stars. Man, that gauged the difficulty just perfect. That review gets <laughs> I read. I totally agree. I totally agree. That review gets read. This game was awesome. I loved it. Me and my team got stuck at a couple points, but the hints were good, and we just had so much fun, da 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 And, yeah, it was a guiding factor that was completely forgotten about after yeah. the fact. But it's never on the other. You're right. It's never on the other I remember end. when we did the episode for Wild Optimists, specifically with uh, both their games um, that are with Flashback. The Amazon reviews? The Amazon reviews, man. If you don't remember that episode, you should go back and listen to it. Yes. That's one of my favorites. But uh, specifically the part about it being like, you know, most of the negatives were the time and difficulty. Yep. Like everyone being like, well, I expected this to be three paths that were all 90 minutes each, and it turns out it was 30 minutes. Like, you know, it took 90 minutes to do all, like, you know, they were more like 15 to 30 minutes each. Yes. You know, people expected way more, but part of that was their own comprehension sure. of what it was saying. But at the end of the day, that's the most popular complaint I see in most mass market is when there is a difficulty, it is, it is brought up. Right. Cause, cause that's what we're talking about. We're talking about parameter setting. Mm -hmm. We're talking about me being able to prescribe to you the best game so that when you hop on Amazon, you can say, I want to play a game that lasts a minimum of two hours and is this difficult and costs me this much money. Mm -hmm. Right. We're all talking about honing in on what the best experience is. And it feels like for those that put it out there, they wield it, they deal with the consequences for those that don't, maybe they're afraid to because of those very things or just because they've realized, well, that's not why our players care about. Sure. So let me, let me ask you this, and this hones in onto a conversation we were having in the first part of the show, is do you think that most of the games and experience that we play are too hard for the general public? No. Talk to me more about that. Um, I think they can be difficult. I think too hard, the wording, I think, could be changed only because I think most people's level of, like, puzzle solving and, like, decision making is good enough to play most games now you might need a little bit of help sure but most of the puzzles in most games we play aren't that nuts they're very and most of them give you tools to help you solve them and hint systems and hence like there's a like a lot of them tell you that hey literally this is morse this is how you solve morse hey this is how you do a basic cipher like you know there are people who've never seen those things every time that i go in an escape room and i and i meet someone who's never played before and they go what the heck's a cipher i laugh right but i mean there are people like that that don't know any of those systems and that's the majority of the world correct now and that's fine but I, but I guess the difference is that if you have any willpower and drive to complete a game, they aren't that difficult. It's not like you're doing an SAT or you're doing something that's going to do like your whole world depends on you ma making a hundred. Sure. It, it is like, Hey, spend five minutes learning how this puzzle works and you can get it. You know, there's a few games we've played that like, okay, even us having more experience, it challenged us. Right. But I, I, I think a majority of the games are not the most crazy difficult games that the general public couldn't do. Um, I think the only difference is that they have to be willing to work at it. Sure. I, that's how I'd put it. Well, but I, I, I'll, I'll play devil's advocate here a little. Sure. The puzzle genre isn't new to the medium that you and I talk about a lot. Sure. Puzzles have been around for ever ages. Yeah. Right. 
video games, you, you name your medium, we've more often than not seen puzzles as a part of it. But I think we all identify the concept of a puzzle with some added level of difficulty okay. men- mentally, okay. right? So if you if you talk about puzzlers in the genre of video games, you know that you may be getting bogged down into something that you can't just dexterously drive yourself through. It doesn't come down to necessarily your skill in that arena. It's a different skill that may ask more of us. Sure. So I wonder is just puzzles in general, are we doing ourselves a disservice by not onboarding more individuals into our world with simpler games? I could... I, I could understand that. I mean, I think I agree that we should have more games that are more onboarding for the whole experience or the experiences themselves. Don't get me wrong. And I, I could understand, like, I mean, one of the biggest examples that I remember that was very popular is when the, I think it's Insomniac is the, is the company that makes the Spider-Man games for the PS4 and PS5. Yes. Um, the Spider-Man games, one of the, I think the most interesting parts is it has a, uh, a mechanic in the game that you have to do solve puzzles to get certain missions done. Now, they added an option you can skip the puzzles. And one of the most popular things I ever saw when I saw people playing is they did not want to do the puzzles. Yeah, they want to skip it. They want to skip it and just go back to fighting. And that makes sense, but it's a little disappointing. And, you know, at times, because, you know, for me, it's like that puzzle is not the most crazy. But people, like you said, a lot of people don't want to be challenged. That's the other part of it. Some people like the challenge and a lot of people are like, hey, man, I'm literally just playing this to do the story. And I just want to I just want to shoot spider webs at things. I, I don't give a care if I have to add two plus two. Right. You know, and that that's a fair thing that a lot of people don't want to do that. People don't want to challenge themselves sometimes. Like they like, and that's the other thing. Some people like feeling that they're smart and don't want to be challenged. So they, they almost ignore it. So they don't feel like they're getting challenged. Absolutely. Like I I'm smart, but I'm like, Oh, well, did you try this? I'm like, well, no, I know I'm smart. I'm like, well, you should, you should try this. And they're like, well, what if I feel you know, like, what if I fail? I, I look stupid. Right. And, and like, people hate that. People hate feeling stupid. Yes. Uh, I, I get it. I definitely get your point of view on that then. And I, and I think that's what I'm wondering. And if you go back and listen to old episodes of ours, I'm constantly weaving this question in my mind back and forth is what is the best way that we as a community invite people into this world mm-hmm. to enjoy the things that we love so much that we honestly repeat so many of the same types of puzzles, but we become more familiar. I would argue that puzzle solving is a skill that you acquire, that you get better at. I think some of the best puzzlers in the world would agree with that. It's something that you work at, you get better at, you become more familiar with. Agreed. But but it, in my opinion, it has more barriers in its way to enjoyment than some of the other things that puzzles are involved in, right? Puzzling for puzzle's sake is, it's an acquired taste. It sometimes feels more intellectual, but I think there's a lot of creators out there right now that are inviting a more broad group of people into like, hey, don't be scared of this. Like, Don't be worried about this. And I think Escape Mail is one of those companies, right? And you're going to hear some of that in the interview about some of the cool things that they're doing. But I just feel like they have a really strong grasp on adjusting this to the audience that's in front of them. And we need that. We need that so much because I want people to come in, play an Escape Mail, and then say, hey, I'm ready for some of the Enigma Emporium stuff, right? Like, Mm -hmm. I'm ready for some of the more... And, and Enigma Emporium isn't even the most difficult stuff out there, but I, I enjoy Enigma Emporium a lot, but I can't hand that to a first-time player okay. and expect them to enjoy that. But if I get some other games out there front-running, getting them into our world, then I can hand them some Enigma Emporium, and they'd be like, dang, that was tight, dude. Like, yeah. that was awesome. Like, that was so well done. It's develop- I, I want to develop an appreciation and help people to develop an appreciation for all of the puzzle world has to offer. And that's what I enjoy. So I think if you're a puzzle person out there, you play Escape Mail and you're saying like, eh, like, I didn't like that. Help me get excited for somebody that we can hand that to that's never played that for before because it has value. Mm -hmm. There is so much value in that. And that's what I get excited about because I feel like we are we can and we're constantly developing an appreciation for what we see and who we can hand a game to. Sure. I like that. That was a good, good, good talk. Yeah, I think that was that was a fun topic to say the least. I love that. That's a good talk. We hope you like that talk too. If you're out there, we're going to be start throwing a lot of these conversations into the general public uh, on some of these groups that we're a part of. 
we look forward to having that discussion with you and being a part of that. But that's going to wrap us up for Puzzles to the People. Questions for creators coming at you next. There are some awesome people who make the puzzles we love to solve. This is Questions for Creators. Zach, listen, man, we, we need to have a talk. Okay. What about? Well, I got your postcard in the mail, and I'm worried, man. Nothing made sense on it, and there was even things in there that implicated you in some kind of larger conspiracy organization. Yeah, I really don't see what the problem with that is. <laughs> wait, wait, no, this this isn't how our ads work. You usually, this is the part where you say, oh, it's a game and crazy, Jared, and we do that whole little shtick. But you're not saying that this time, so is this true? Well, if you're curious to find out what is true, you should head over to theenigmaemporium.com and check out the Wish You Were Here series. Oh, so it is a game, right? Zach? Zach? Come on, man, what's true? Well, welcome back to Puzzling Company, guys. We are now in our segment that is Question for Creators. So if you've never listened to this segment before, well, you're in for a treat. This segment, we get to bring people on, usually creators of these amazing games that we do play, and kind of get to have a discussion with them and kind of ask them questions about like their process for getting the game, why they made it, you know, what they're playing, so on and so forth. Uh, so Jared, I'm not going to tell you who's on the show because I think it'd be great if they introduced themselves. Absolutely. But I, I don't know if you felt this way, but I really enjoyed getting to talk to them about you know, the game that we're talking about today. I do too. I, um, now we, you'll see, we only get to talk to 50%. There's two creators in this world. We're going to get to talk to one of them, but their background and what they've done with the puzzle escape game world, um, I think is really cool, very unique and more of what we need. But again, I don't want to get too far into this. Let's meet them. Tell us your name and how your company came into existence. So my name is Eric Reynolds. I'm a co-founder at Mobile Escape, and uh, we exist to awaken wonder. Um, people know us because we bring the escape room to them. And ever since we started doing that in 2016, my brother-in-law and I, Paul, um, we've always been about awakening wonder. So what that used to look like was uh, two 30-foot cargo trailers with two escape rooms in each. Uh, different themes. We've changed them out a few times. So we got Tomb of the Pharaoh, Sunken Submarine, Da Vinci's Workshop, uh, and a few others. And we brought those to events across Alberta, Canada. Um, our emphasis was on providing uh, escape rooms uh, to schools and not just rooms, but also programs associated with escape rooms. So we actually taught kids how to make their own escape room in the school. And so we did that with uh, over 100,000 kids in Alberta, and uh, and it was a blast. So it sounded like you were having a lot of success with that. What inspired you to go away from doing things in schools and move towards the product that we're talking about today? So I got a text on a Sunday afternoon and from a, from a coworker who said, hey, did you hear school is, is closed or canceled indefinitely? And I just well, I couldn't believe it. I thought, when has this ever happened in the history of school? Uh, and so we were in a we were in a pickle because we weren't allowed up on site, and that's uh, that was our bread and butter. So um, our our business model was shut down in a matter of minutes. Um, we canceled every school event in the calendar. We deleted every invoice. Uh, we had to let go of most of our staff. Uh, but now, in light of COVID nineteen, we've rebuilt our company. Um, and we've actually pivoted with uh, an innovative new product called Escape Mail. It's allowed more people to experience mobile escape and our goal to awaken wonder uh, than, than we ever could have before. Um, so we're now a global mail order puzzle business uh, based in Alberta, Canada, and we still bring the escape room to you. It just looks different. Why did you choose the medium you chose? I think the, the reason we went that way is we sort of asked ourselves, what are we good at? You know, anytime you're you're sort of left in uh, a lurch uh, and you get the rug pulled out from under your feet, you kind of got to go back to the basics and say, okay, who are we? You know, what what are we good at? And so we kind of thought thought to ourselves, wait a second. For the last four years, we've been teaching kids how to make escape rooms using simple materials. So 
paper, scissors, glue, string. Um, and we taught them, we taught them how to do this every single day. We were building prototypes and, and making puzzles out of simple materials. So we thought, let's just keep a good thing going. Um, so that's why we went with a very, very simple standard envelope. We thought it would be a low cost solution. So, I mean, you can buy your 20, 30, 40, $50 escape game. Um, but we want it to be sub $20. Um, we wanted to have an overarching storyline because we found a lot of escape rooms lack on the narrative piece. And we really believe in the power of narrative and storytelling. So we thought, okay, let's, let's engage people over the course of a year. Um, and so we, we did that and we're now on episode 11 out of 12. You talked a little bit about this in your last question, but take us into the world of, of you guys developing a narrative for your games. We thought to ourselves, hey, when you do, so, so let me take a step back. In our mobile unit, we have two rooms. They're very different themes. And the reason we do that is because when we show up to your event, we recognize that you didn't have a choice in the theme. But because there's two very different themes, there's something that's going to appeal to you. So in choosing to do the, the season one 12-episode uh, storyline, we thought to ourselves, it'll be very important that we bring variety to, to, the, uh, to the equation here. So, you know, episode one has a sort of old time pirate treasure map feel, whereas episode two, we tried to make it as different as possible. So it's got a, a submarine, underwater, futuristic, high tech feel. Now, it's, it's still in an envelope, but the, the theme and a lot of the visuals uh, are change up. So we, and we try and do that. We try and actually spring back and forth and all over the place in terms of theme. So variety, you know, giving the puzzler lots of variety there. How did you go about creating the puzzles in your games? I would say our puzzles have evolved um, as the seasons progress. And I think you'll see that in the reviews. I think you'll see we're on an upward trajectory. Um, one of the big uh, reviewers, uh, Escape the Rumors, they've, they've commented that the games just keep getting better. Um, and especially episode 10, which is the last one that just came out, um, it's getting unbelievable reviews. And I, and I think that speaks to, you know, what we're doing, we're sort of honing a craft. Yes, we made escape rooms before, but escape mail is different, right? Like, and it's all paper. There is sort of an art to it. Um, when you're holding a lock in your hands, you know, a few things, you know, the number of digit entries, you know, what the values are. And you can test if you got it right or not. It's very, very easily, rapidly, actually. So a paper-based version doesn't have a lot of those um, uh, parameters. So you need to come up with other ways of, of validating, of making the inputs clear um, without it feeling spoon-fed and contrived. And that's been very, very tricky for us to get right. And I, I hope you know, we continue to do that better and better. Um, but there's definitely an art to it, right? What can we expect from the future of Escape Mail? Uh, and do you have other different games in the future that we might experience in the at-home puzzle and mystery world? Yeah, we have a lot of exciting things on the horizon. Um, most important is to finish the season well. And so episode 11 is going out to play testers any day. And episode 12 is actually very far along in its development. It needed to be because of the way we've alluded to it in past episodes. And so um, season one finishing well is going to be really important. Um, this is the first time I, we've ever made this known, but there's a, a surprise coming for um, all the subscribers at the end of the 12th episode um, that I think everyone will be pretty, uh, pretty excited about. Um, and then in addition to that, season two is, is on our minds. But before we tackle season two, We've got a few games that um, have sort of captivated our attention and our imagination. Um, and it's around the concept of um, games for social good. And so we've, over the course of our history, we've become quite good at taking curriculum, like, uh, like uh, especially from the Alberta curriculum, um, and finding a way to weave it into our escape rooms. And that's actually a skill we have in addition to just creating a good puzzle. We're actually you know, we'll take that escape room to a birthday party and they'll have no idea that they're learning, you know, part of the curriculum as they do it. So we thought, hey, why don't we do this with escape mail? And um, we didn't try and do that in season one. 
but we're thinking of doing that on some on certain topics like climate change, for example. Um, uh, and then there's a few other topics that are are kind of near and dear to our hearts that we want to weave them in in such a way that you don't even know you're learning, right? You don't even recognize it, but along the way, you're picking up some really useful information. Um, and yeah, we hope, hope to sort of inspire change and awaken wonder in a in a bit of more intentional way. So that that's probably on the horizon before a season two. And of course, the classic question that we ask everyone, what games are you currently playing that you think our listeners should check out? Yeah, so I'll just go back in most recent and go backwards. So I just played ID Ventures Clue Box. It's not a it's not a um envelope. It's like a literal like puzzle box. Um and I really enjoyed that. It, um, you know, as a player, it's a totally different experience where you go, like I, I played it three times and it's 20, 30 minutes. It's, and I could, I solved something and then got stuck and came back to it. And, um, so yeah, that was, a, that was a blast. I have a puzzle ninja book. It's all about Japanese, like, you know, Sudoku. Yeah. So Sudoku is one of many, um, Japanese like logic games. Um, and I haven't found a way to incorporate them in our puzzles yet because they're so specific in their application, but that's, I really, um, I really like them. I'm not very good at solving them, but I really like them. I have, um, a couple, I have both journal 29s here. I have, um, society of curiosities, scarlet envelope, uh, Hinks Gazette, um, curious correspondence club, um, a couple others, but yeah, those are, those are, I've played the exit, you know, games and stuff like that. So those would be a few. I just really like Eric. I have so much fun talking to him and I, I'm excited to see where their company goes. If you're interested in picking up a copy of Escape Mail, you can head over to mobileescape.ca. That's mobileescape.ca and pick up a groovy letter of a game that we really, really enjoyed. And if you're wondering how you can help Puzzling Company, there's a number of different ways. I would say hop on your phone, get on the podcast app, whatever that is, hit subscribe. That would be super helpful. You can also follow us on Instagram, Facebook. We are available there. And if you're ever out there wanting to drop us a line, you've got a game that you want us to review, contact at puzzlingcompany.com. You can find us there, whatever support you can. And just a big shout out to all of the creators that do send us games for us to review especially our creator today. Thank you so much for all of that. Zach, anything in closing? What's running through your mind? I had a good time. This was a good episode, to say the least. I'm I'm very excited, though, to talk about next week's episode as well. Well, who are we have the privilege of reviewing next week? Man, I've really been wanting to join, like, a society for detectives. Oh, well, do I have the society for you? What? Yeah, next week we're going to be jumping into detective society, a wonderful game over from the UK. We'll be excited about visiting with you guys next week. But for Jared and Zach, this has been another wonderful episode of Puzzling Company. See you guys. Thanks for listening. Find us on social media at Puzzling Company and online at puzzlingcompany.com. Check back weekly for new episodes. Until next time, keep puzzling. This has been Globe Media Network Podcast.